Hey everyone, it's Nurse Sarah, and in this video, I'm going to be going over accelerated junctional rhythm. So let's get started. This is an abnormal rhythm that arises from the electrical structures in the AV junction. And whenever I'm referring to the AV junction, I'm mainly talking about the AV node, but it could also be the bundle of Hiss. So what's happened with these electrical structures is that they have had a boost in their automaticity. Now, what is automaticity? Well, this is just a fancy way of saying that the cells that make up these structures have become supercharged, more than normal. Therefore, they have a more accelerated function. And because of this accelerated function, they can take over and stimulate the heart to beat without something stimulating it to do so. When this happens, it overrides the main pacemaker of the heart, which is the SA node, the sinoatrial node. And in most cases of accelerated junctional rhythm, the reason it's presenting is because there's something wrong with this SA node. It's sending out electrical signals way too slowly. Therefore, it has a decrease in its automaticity. So how is accelerated junctional going to appear? Well, first, let's go over how an ECG waveform should appear normally and how it's created, and then compare that to accelerated junctional. The electrical conduction system starts in the SA node, known as the sinoatrial node. And this is found in the upper part of the right atrium. And it's the site for the main pacemaker, which causes your heart to beat at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. So whenever the SA node fires, it sends electrical signals downward throughout those atria. And whenever it does this, this causes atrial depolarization, which leads to contraction of your atria. Now we can pick up this contraction of the atria on the ECG by looking at the P wave. That's what the P wave represents, your atria contracting. So the P wave should have these certain characteristics to it if the SA node is firing like it should. The P wave should be upright and there should be one in front of every QRS complex. Then after electrical signals leave the SA node, it goes down to the AV node. And this is really like the second pacemaker of the heart. It causes the heart to beat at about 40 to 60 beats per minute. And it has the nickname gatekeeper because what the AV node does is it causes a delay in electrical signaling so the atria can fully empty into the ventricles. Then once it leaves this spot, it goes down to the bundle of Hiss, which is like our third pacemaker, and it causes the heart to beat at about 20 to 40 beats per minute. Then electrical signals go down through the bundle branches. We have right and left bundle branches and to the Purkinje fibers. And then we get ventricle depolarization. So we get the contraction of those ventricles. Now, whenever the ventricles contract, they are going to create the QRS complex. That represents ventricle depolarization. And then after that, since they've contracted, they now have to rest. So we're going to have ventricle repolarization and the ventricles are so big that when they relax, they are going to create the T wave. And then this process repeats itself over and over again. So what you want to take away from this is how that ECG waveform should look and what certain parts should measure because you need that information whenever you're trying to analyze abnormal rhythms. So first thing you want to make sure you have one P wave in front of one QRS complex. That P wave is upright. Then from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex is known as the PR interval. You always want to measure this and this should measure anywhere between point 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. And the PR interval is the delay in conduction by the AV node. Then you want to take a look at that QRS complex. It should measure less than 0.12 seconds. And then you can look at the QT interval that starts at the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. It can measure anywhere between 0.35 to 0.44 seconds. This really varies depending on gender and if your heart rate is fast or if it is slow. And then you want to take a look at that T wave and make sure that it is upright and where it's supposed to be. So with that said, what's happening in accelerated junctional rhythm is that the electrical structures in that AV junction have an increased action potential. Because for instance, the AV node normally it beats about 40 to 60 beats per minute. But if we increase 
increases automaticity, we're going to have a faster rate. And an accelerated junctional rhythm, one of the hallmarks you want to remember is that it has a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. So whenever we're looking at the electrical conduction system in this rhythm, electrical signals are going to leave the AV junction just like they should and go down through the ventricles. So because it's going normally down through the ventricles, it's going to cause normal ventricle depolarization. So you're going to see a normal QRS complex. It's going to be narrow. It's going to be less than 0.12 seconds. You'll see a normal QT interval and a normal T wave. However, the problem arises with how the P wave is going to present because whenever electrical signals leave this AV junction, they're actually going to send signals up through the atria. And normally these signals should not go up through the atria. The SA node normally sends the electrical signals down through the atria. So because we have these electrical signals going, hence retrograde, we're going to have a profound effect on our P wave. And what I mean by this is that the P wave can appear in different locations on that ECG waveform. It may be in front of the QRS complex, but if it is, it'll be very close to that QRS complex, which will create a very short PR interval. Remember, PR interval should be 0.12 seconds to 0.20 seconds, but it's going to be less than this. In addition, that P wave can be hidden or concealed where it's actually within that QRS complex, or the P wave can be after the QRS complex. And then whenever you're looking at the P wave in leads 2, 3, and AVF, it will appear upside down. So to help you remember that information about that peculiar P wave in this rhythm, let's remember this little jingle. Inverted P on AVF 2 and 3 before after QRS if you can see. Sometimes it hides and you can't see it at all. When it appears in the front, the PR interval is small. So now let's look at this rhythm strip of accelerated junctional. When we look at this rhythm, we can see immediately that there are no visible P waves. Actually here, our P waves are concealed within our QRS complex. Then when we take a look at the QRS complex, we can see that it is narrow. Here it measures about 0.06 seconds. And when we measure from R wave to R wave, we will notice that it occurs regular. So we have a regular ventricular rate. And here our QT interval is normal. It measures around 0.36 seconds and our T wave is normal. Then when we go to count the rate, we get 80 beats per minute. So this meets the criteria for accelerated junctional. It has a regular rate between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Our P waves are concealed within our QRS complexes. Our QRS complex is narrow. We have a normal QT interval and a normal T wave. Now what can cause this rhythm? Well, the main cause is digoxin toxicity. Toxicity. However, it can occur if we have damage to our heart muscle because remember our heart muscle in there are electrical structures. So if we decrease blood flow to these electrical structures, this can occur, especially in a myocardial infarction where we have an inferior infarction. Or if we have inflammation of that myocardium like myocarditis or if the patient has had cardiac surgery. Now, what is our role as a nurse? Well, whenever we see that our patient's in this rhythm, we want to assess them and see if they're having symptoms. Many times patients are not going to have symptoms with this rhythm because that rate is within 60 to 100 beats per minute and they're able to maintain their cardiac output. Therefore, we will continue to monitor them, but we wanna be looking at some potential causes, especially if they're on digoxin or maybe if they have some electrolyte imbalance, we want to further investigate that. Now, sometimes symptoms can present with this rhythm and it happens if electrical signals cause the ventricles to contract first and then the atria contract. Because remember, we're having retrograde signaling going up through the atria. So if this happens, it's going to cause the atria to decrease in their ability to empty fully into those ventricles. So we're gonna have a lower blood volume that will go into the ventricles. If we have that, we're going to lower cardiac output. So you wanna be monitoring for those signs and symptoms associated with lower cardiac output, which can be shortness of breath, hypotension, dizziness, chest pain, increased capillary refill, and a weak pulse. Now circling back to those causes of this rhythm, as a nurse, we play a huge role with identifying toxicity issues. For instance, like with digoxin toxicity. 
So you want to be looking at those early signs and symptoms that this can be occurring. So some early symptoms that your patient may be experiencing introduction toxicity is that they will have GI related issues, like they'll have nausea and vomiting. And then as it progresses, their vision can be affected where they have blurred vision or they're starting to see yellowish green halos. Now ECG changes happen a little bit later on. So we want to be able to identify that early. In addition, we'll be looking at their lab work. So a normal digoxin level is anywhere between 0.5 to 2 nanograms per milliliter. So any level greater than 2 nanograms per milliliter, we're going into toxicity territory. And you want to be familiar with the antidote for digoxin, which is really easy to remember because it's digifab and you see the digi, it's like similar to digoxin. So that's easy to commit to your memory. Plus with this, we want to be looking at electrolyte levels because if we have an alteration or imbalance in our electrolytes, it can lead to accelerated junctional rhythm. So you want to look at their lab work, see what their latest potassium level increased or a decreased potassium could lead to accelerated junctional or an imbalance with calcium, magnesium, and sodium because all of these electrolytes play a role with our muscle contraction and other functions. And if your patient is presenting with those signs and symptoms of a decreased cardiac output, you wanna prep them for temporary pacing. This temporary pacemaker will help improve cardiac output until further treatment can be provided. Okay, so that wraps up this video on accelerated junctional rhythm. And don't forget to access the free quiz that will test you on this material in the link below.